Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here at the Paris Air Show at the historic Le Bourget Airfield outside the French capital. Our coverage here is sponsored by L3 Technologies and Leonardo DRS, and we're positively honored to have our next guest, uh, retired U.S. Navy Captain Chris Ferguson, who is uh, the last uh, space shuttle commander. Uh, a man with three missions under his belt in space, more than 40 days uh, in orbit, including a construction mission. Uh, and you are now the director of space and mission support uh, for the director of crew and mission support at Boeing Defense Space and Security. Sir, thanks very much for joining us. Very good. That's a mouthful. You remembered it all. Nice job. I want to start by asking you about the Starliner program. Mm -hmm. uh, that falls, uh, falls in your purview. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the spacecraft and the kind of capabilities and, and the, prog you know, the status of that program, which is going to constitute the next phase of America's reusable uh, uh, space launch uh, system along with the, you know, as part of the Orion program overall. Absolutely. Well, of course, this is a program to take back business from the Russian Soyuz. Americans have been hitching a ride, so to speak, since the end of the space shuttle program in 2011, back and forth to the International Space Station. So uh, NASA uh, has uh, instituted a commercial crew program uh, whereby they'll underwrite the development of a capability to get Americans back and forth from American soil. Uh, we are in the latter stages. Uh, we, uh, we certainly hope to get at least one, preferably three missions off next year, uh, uh, two of which will be test missions, missions, and one is a servicing mission to deliver astronauts and, uh, and bring that capability back to the United States. Um, talk to us about the spacecraft, the support module, and the, some of the features and other attributes that this spacecraft is going to have. Sure. So it, it'll, it'll be very Apollo-like, so it's a smaller package. The space shuttle was a wonderful vehicle. Uh, it also carried 50,000 pounds of cargo. We didn't have a requirement to carry 50,000 pounds of cargo, only to carry four astronauts back and forth. So it'll be capsule-shaped. We'll have a service module uh, on the back to propel us around uh, orbital space in our rendezvous trajectory to the ISS. And we're going to launch on an Atlas V vehicle, which is a very proven and reliable vehicle that's been in service since early 2000. And, uh, and has uh, DNA roots that, uh, you know, at least the Atlas name goes back to the, to the start of the space program itself. Um, do, what are some of the um, novel features that you guys are including in this, both for uh, you know, to, to help speed orbital rendezvous, for example. You guys are trying to get up to the space station in about six hours as opposed to a 24-hour, uh, you know, path in order to try to get up there. Uh, what are some of the features that this is also going to have um, to give it that extended life capability of being able to do multiple missions at a lower support cost, for example, than the space shuttle, which was a DC-9-sized spacecraft, right? It was a gigantic uh, vehicle. So probably the biggest innovation is complete autonomy. Now, the astronauts will always be there to back the vehicle up, but the idea is that the astronauts that are being transported to the International Space Station are first and foremost space station astronauts. They have a six-month mission ahead of them. They've had to study science and the operation of the space station in general. We wanted to provide them with a relatively simple ride that would largely take care of itself, and it was a NASA requirement that it conduct its mission autonomously. So it will dock. It will launch and dock, as you said, within ideally six hours, but as long as 24 hours, and uh, it, with very little intervention from the astronaut. Now, they can take over manual if they need to, and I have a feeling they may want to, but in general, uh, you'll see us docked uh, shortly after launch. We'll stay there for six complete months, serving as a lifeboat in the event anything should happen to the space station. They need to jump on their lifeboat and return back to Earth. But normally they'll return after a six-month mission is complete to one of our landing sites, a land landing site in the Western United States. And talk to us about how you're going to do it, because the Russians, for example, uh, drop the heat shield. There are rockets uh, uh, that go off to cushion that impact before they, they land, always in Central Asia, which is uh, they, they take off and they land in Central Asia. What, what's the setup that we're going to use to do the same thing? It's actually very similar. Uh, we'll use a series of uh, pyrotechnic-initiated parachute deployments to slow our uh, to slow our descent to parachute speed. And then, instead of using a retro rocket like the uh, like the Russian system does, we too will jettison our base heat shield about 3,000 feet off the ground, and we'll deploy uh, a series of six airbags uh, around the perimeter of the uh, of the the, the crew module, uh, and they're about five feet in diameter. Uh, they'll cushion the final landing. There's blowout features such that when the pressure rises to a certain value, uh, it, it'll slow the descent down and we'll absorb that final impact down to something that's a comfortable three or four Gs. Uh, Gus Grissom was the lead in developing the Gemini spacecraft. Uh, he actually had the key role of developing the Apollo spacecraft uh, uh, when, when he and his uh, uh, shipmates uh, died in the Apollo 1 fire. 
But here was a guy who was developing the spacecraft and he was going to be the first to fly it. Are you going to be the first to fly the Starliner into space? Well, first let me say it has been a privilege to come into this program at the, at the juncture where I did five years ago. Uh, I, I brought a small team on board who knew an awful lot about space shuttle and space flight in general, not to mention how a crew interfaces with a spacecraft, and we had a clean slate. We got a, had an opportunity to build it up to the, uh, to the kind of vehicle that it is today, and today, in test, we're beginning to see it come to life. All the displays, all the ways that the crew can interact with the vehicle. Um, and as to answer the question, would I, would I be thrilled to go to space again? Absolutely but no decisions have been made in any particular direction. Although I have to say, you look pretty good in those spacesuit photographs. Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, astronaut yesterday, spacesuit model today. Uh -huh. yeah. right, well, sir, you know, one career, you did the Navy, you did space, and you know, hey, modeling could be in your, in your future. Um, I want to take you to the, to the space shuttle. Extraordinary vehicle, um, was really our, our lifeline, a technological marvel. Um, it did get a little long in the tooth, continually updated. Two missions tragically uh, uh, ended badly, uh, but tell us what it was like to, to fly that vehicle, uh, to fly it in space, but also to, to glide a vehicle of that size at that speed. Um, you know, to talk to us about what it was like to fly that, one of the most extraordinary air and spacecraft ever made. Uh, well, as you had said, it was an amazing design. 50-foot-long uh, payload bay, able to carry 50,000 pounds of payload and seven astronauts at one time to space. Uh, it'll be a long time before we see a vehicle like that again. Now, that said, it, it did have, um, it did have some, some weak areas. Specifically, it didn't have an abort system. Uh, and when I say abort system, I mean a way to get away from a rocket that could be having a bad day behind you. Uh, therein lies one of the big differences between the way we used to do business and the way we intend to do business going forward is to always provide that ejection seat capability for astronauts. Uh, but back to the space shuttle, it was an amazing ride. Uh, there are a few what I call gee whiz moments in spaceflight. Uh, one of them is having the privilege prior to ascending the tower and getting into the shuttle on launch day of standing at the base and watching that fully fueled vehicle huffing and wheezing and giving off vapor and moisture condensing in the form of water pouring off in buckets from the bottom of the external tank and you have a chance to stand at the base of that and look up and pinch yourself and say the Americans are really going to let me take this into space today. Uh, but it's a wonderful ride once you get up there. It felt like the family minivan, a lot of comfort. Uh, it, uh, it performed dramatically, uh, not to mention the fact that we could always carry our luggage with us in the back and it was absolutely pivotal in, in uh, the assembly of the International Space Station having committed 33 missions exclusively to constructing the ISS. Uh, as far as uh, the opportunity to come home and land it, um, there are some residual adverse effects from being in zero G for a long period of time, namely your vestibular system is a little bit off. I always wondered what it would be like to try to fly an airplane when you're a little off balance, but it actually comes back to you very quickly. Uh, a little bit of a roll or two that you're allowed to do prior to the final landing is enough to sort of get, help you get your bearings back again. And uh, every landing, as you can see, has turned out to be a happy one for the space shuttle. So it, it worked out really well for all of us, and I was just happy to be a part of it all. And what was its uh, handling qualities like? I mean, was there was there you know a significant lag between an input and and uh, you know the response of the spacecraft? And how much you know flex? I mean, you know, a lot of like big airplanes have some flex in them. Uh, sometimes did she have a little bit of a flex to her when she was uh, coming back from orbit? Uh, well, as far as handling qualities, uh, it, it flew like a large airplane. It w wasn't exactly as nimble as a fighter, but fortunately we had some really good training aids. Uh, we had a modified Gulfstream airplane that we flew in the atmosphere that flew just like a space shuttle. So you really got accustomed to how quickly the vehicle would respond. Did it flex and flop like a big airplane would, would today? And actually it didn't. Uh, I, I found it remarkable, and perhaps it was the, uh, the, the high fuselage loading and the delta wings that just enabled it to just respond very well in roll. And of course it was fly-by-wire, so they designed out a lot of the negative effects that you would have from flying a large airplane just in a flight computer. Sir, thanks very much. Really enjoyed it, and would love to talk to you again uh, closer to the mission. My pleasure.